rise among us, let it rise. Hallelujah. Lord, let it rise. Let's build up the faith right now. Let the mountain of faith rise among us. Let the mountain of faith rise among us. Let the will of a king in your will rise among us. Let it rise. Lord, let it rise. The glory. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let this song for a king rise among us. Let it rise. Let it rise. Ooh, let it rise. Presence. Let the presence of God rise among us. Let the presence of God rise among us. Splendor of a king, rise among us, let it rise. Lord, 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 let it rise. Let's tone it down a little bit. Just keep on that. Father, let your presence come down in a tangible way, Father. Let your tangible presence come among us, Father. Let the sweet smell of heaven begin to fill this place, Father. Let it fill our hearts, our hearts, our hearts, and our hearts. Let it fill our soul, Father. Let the love take control. A love song, Father, for you. Let the love take control. Let one of the fruits of the Spirit, let this the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. I speak joy. Let the joy of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the Lord rise among us. Let the strength of a king rise among us. Let it rise. Lord, let it rise. Presence. Let the presence of God rise among us. Let the presence of God rise among us. Let the splendor of a king rise among us. Let it rise. Let it rise. Lord, let it rise. Glory. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let this song for a king rise among us. Let it rise. Let it rise. Lord, Ooh, let it rise. Last time, glory. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let this song for King rise among us. Let it rise. Christians, it's not always easy. <laughs> but the Father says, be holy because I am holy. So when you make a mistake, don't beat yourself about it. Because the Father says that you, <laughs> you and you, and you, 
are His righteousness. The Lord is good because He chose us to be His righteousness. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. And everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. And hope of nations. The hope of this nation. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Take me as you find me, with all my fears abandoned, and fill my life again. I give my life to follow, and everything I believe in, and I surrender, I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Forever, author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Your light shine, shine your light, and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light, and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. That we're singing for the glory of the risen King, Savior. Savior, He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the Savior. Savior, he can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. And conquer the grave. Ah, sing it holy, holy. Sing holy, holy. You are holy. holy. Light. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus. 
Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King, Savior. Savior, He can burn a mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Let us make these declarations. A declaration of seeing heaven. A declaration of glory falling. A declaration of his presence. A declaration of the angels being released in this place. A declaration that we want to worship our King. A declaration that we want to see Him face to face. presence 
Let your presence fill this place. Let heaven come. Let your angels be released. Let heaven come. We will worship at your feet. Let heaven come. Face to face we want to meet. Let heaven come. And we give you praise and all of the honor. You are our God, the one we live for. We give you praise and all of the glory, God. Is God the Father truly the God of your life? Is Jesus your King? That's what these words are about. Saying that you are King. You are my Lord. And I give everything to you, Father. We give everything to you, Father. Our deepest humility our deepest embarrassments, our greatest triumphs, Father. We give you all of us. We give you everything, Father. We give you praise and all of the glory, God. We give you praise all of the honor you are our god the one we live for we give you praise and all of the glory god Let the sun of heaven come out. Let the sun of heaven come out. I just want to be with you. I just want to be with you. Just like you.
let your presence let your presence fill this place let heaven come let your angels be released let heaven and come we will worship at your feet let heaven and come face to face we want to meet let heaven come and we give you praise and all of the honor you are our god the one we live for we give you praise and all of the glory god lift your voices church and we give you praise and all of the honor you are our god the one we live for we give you praise and all of the glory god <laughs> and we give you praise and all of the honor you are our god the one we live for we give you praise and all of the glory god last time and we give you praise and all of the honor you are our god the one we live for we give you praise and all of the glory god In the name of Jesus, because he said that I'm an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ that gives me authority, and because he died, and he said, Jesus said, all the power is given to me, and not in these words, but he said, and I'm going to share it with all of my buddies. So because of that power, in the name of Jesus, I command every soul to praise, every eye to be open to see the kingdom of heaven. Because we don't have to die to see the kingdom of heaven. We can see it right now. Let our ears be opened up. Let us hear the angelic. Let us hear the songs of heaven. Let us hear the voice of Father. We've entered with thanksgiving. And we've definitely entered his courts. Father is showing me his part of his throne. And he's showing me how the water is coming out. The water is coming out from under it. the streams of life. Father, let those waters pour over every person here. Let it pour over the ground to make it holy as you are holy. Let us see
heaven's mercy seat. Holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing Praise to the King and Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. the mention of his name let's everybody let us be united let us scream out his name Jesus we'll start from the beginning filled with wonder filled with wonder awestruck wonder at the mention of your name one two three <laughs> Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, and such a marvelous mystery. Yeah, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Yeah, all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you.
strong and mighty I call you king when I need to be loved I call you daddy Daddy, Daddy, 
just the drums. Let the veil down. Let the praise go up. Let the veil down. Let the praise go up. Let the veil down. We're in the love. Let the veil down. Let the praise go up. Let the veil down. Let the praise go up. Let the veil down. We're in the presence. Let the praise go up. Let the veil down. Let the praise go up. Let the veil down. We're in the presence of the Lord. Let the veil down. Let the praise go up. Let the veil down. Let the praise go up. Let the veil down. We're in the presence of the Lord. many of you are so thankful that the veil has been ripped from top to bottom? You know, there was a Jewish historian named Josephus that said four teams of horses could not have ripped the veil in the temple. Four teams, not four horses. Four teams of horses could not have ripped that veil, and it definitely could not have ripped the veil from top to bottom because the Bible says that the veil was ripped from father to this earth. It was supernatural. It was in the midst of the earthquake. It was a midst of the finished work of Calvary. Because of the veil being torn, you and I have access. Thank you, Lord. Just start to thank him. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the access, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we worship you, Lord. We have access. 
Come on. We have access. We have access to the presence, the presence of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the access. Somebody worship the Lord. Oh, Lord, we worship you. We worship you, oh, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 oh Lord. You're worthy, so worthy. You're holy, so holy. new song to the Lord right now. Come on, if you can't sing a new song, then speak to him in tongues. If you can sing in tongues, sing in tongues. You know, uh, Prophet Irene was saying there's something different about tonight's presence. She said um, it's it's both authoritative, but it's very sweet. And I said it's Daddy's presence. How many of you know when Daddy walks in, it's authoritative, but it can be very sweet. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you, Abba Father. Would you get out of your seat? Would you tell somebody, I feel daddy here. How about you?
God bless everyone tonight. God bless everyone. I guess you guys aren't done yet. Didn't we just have a fellowship? I'm kidding. It's good to see you guys, fellowship. Yes, we need to have another one already, right? Obviously, there were some things that were still left unsaid. We, we, everybody still wants to talk. <laughs> All right. So we're going to do the tithes and offerings. Who's ready to give to the Lord? Amen. Amen. All right. We give our offerings and our tithes with joy. Amen. All right. So you guys are ready? Because everybody said amen, so everybody should be ready, right? All right. Well, let's all stand up and say it all together. Whether you're giving or not, let's just all stand up together. Amen. As we receive today's offering, we are believing the Lord for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefit sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, debts paid off, expenses decrease, blessing and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of my financial needs, that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! All right. Give your tithes and offerings to the Lord. Amen. Well, hallelujah. Boy, we we'll take this down. Come on. I'm a little louder than that. Somebody say he's loud. Yeah, yeah okay. Somebody said it. Some of you all really meant it. Um, <laughs> listen, we're going to change up a couple of things. And, and since we don't have any, we don't have any first time visitors here today, right? We're all family here. Okay, good. We're going to change up a couple of things. And I told Pastor Johnny that uh, he'll be doing it from now on. But I want you to know the family, what we're doing, okay? Um, I'm seeing visitors kind of fall through the cracks and the pastors, we're all trying to get better at it. So what we're going to be doing this is uh, after the, the praise and worship and the offering time, Pastor Johnny's going to stay up here and he's going to invite first time visitors to stand to their feet. OK, you, our family, will obviously applaud them and thank them for coming. Amen. OK, some of you sound pretty friendly. Others, I don't know, but um, you're going to you're going to say, hey, great to ha get great to have you. And then what's going to happen during that time is Pastor Gloria. And if needed, when we have lots of visitors coming in, Pastor Jesse will be helping to uh, pass out the visitor cards and give them a small gift. Um, it's just basically a little jar of candy. OK, so you didn't miss out before you say I never got my jar of candy. Um, and then what we're going to do, and this is real important. He's going to invite them to meet the pastor, meaning myself, at the end of service in the foyer, okay? Now, for those of you that need to talk to me after service, I'm still be available for you, but please allow me to go talk to the visitors first, shake their hand, and invite them to join the family, okay? And then if you've got something that you've got to talk about, come talk to me, all right? This is very important because we have to understand that people are trying to connect and we need to help them connect. Somebody say amen. amen. Okay. The other thing we're going to do is on Fellowship Sundays, we're going to have, you know, like on a, on a <coughs> what was it, George, uh, the, the love boat? Uh, you know, they had the captain's table. On Fellowship Sunday, me, my wife, and Jonathan will be sitting at a table. And that table will be for people that are, during the past month, have visited the church for the first time. 
And what that's going to do is allow me to have sit-down time with them, too, in case I haven't. Because quite honestly, we have some visitors that have come a few times, and I just have not gotten to them because I've been with the partners, okay? I want to set those times aside for visitors and all the other times, guys, I'm there for you. Because, listen, the visitors don't have my cell phone. You do, okay? So I, I don't want you to feel like I want to neglect you. But I think that we're neglecting our visitors a little bit. Can you help me with that? All right. Yeah. We, 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 I think we need to stop neglecting our visitors a little bit and let them know that they're not only welcome, but we want them to become part of the family. Can, in fact, let me show you one particular visitor that has become a part of the family. Miss Monica Bracken, would you stand up, please? <laughs> now, from what I under, yeah, give her a round of applause. <laughs> she wasn't born in Texas, but she got here as quick as she could. And from what I understand, that's your third Spurs shirt? Yeah, third this is her third Spurs shirt, okay? So uh, this woman knows what it is to be a Texan, okay? And has become a part of the family so quickly. And so, uh, you know, everyone that talks to her talk about, if you haven't talked to her, talk to her. Everyone talks about what a woman of God she is. Amen? Again, why don't we welcome Miss Monica Bracken here. <laughs> Sorry, Monica, I'm just going to pick on you, all right? Hallelujah. Okay, so does that make any sense? Is there any questions before I start the word? All we're trying to do, listen, your first time in here, it would have been nice to actually meet the pastor, wouldn't it? Okay, and, and the first time you do a fellowship Sunday, we're, you're kind of worried, well, who's going to sit with me? You're going to be invited to sit with the pastor. So that's the idea, okay? Uh, the rest of the month, I'm yours, okay? The, uh, you know, Monday through Friday, I'm yours. I'm just trying to help the, the connection between people that come in, I don't know if you know this, but people that come for the first time, within the first seven minutes, they usually decide if they're coming back or not. Do you know that? And in fact, the more times that we can touch them, meaning uh, contact them and say hello to them, the more likely they are to return. But that has to be within the first seven minutes. So if our greeters are not greeting, okay, and if, if they walk in and we just kind of, we're, we're too busy doing whatever else and we're not saying hello to them, then within seven minutes, they're kind of like, I don't know how nice this church is, until we get to the, the shaking of hands. But then what happens? We're all kind of talking to each other because we know each other, and the visitors are kind of sitting there like this. See, we've got to become more family-oriented. Amen? Because if they're a son or daughter of the Lord, they're our, what? Our brother or sister. Does that make sense? All right, praise the Lord. I'm going to move this up just a little bit. Try not to knock down that oil. All right, we're going to continue. Are we ready in the back to get started? All right, let's get started. We are going to continue with our supernatural identity. Somebody say identity. identity. Somebody say, I know who I am Amen. in Christ. Because yeah. Pastor Jesse taught me. Yeah, yeah somebody, well, wait, wait, wait. okay, anyway. All right, hallelujah. I want to thank you for the vote of confidence. Amen. All right, who wants their family to be great? Anybody? You want your family to be great? Who wants to have a lasting legacy? Okay? A legacy that keeps going. Okay? I don't know about you, but I do. And in some ways, developing a, a culture, a royal culture, <coughs> excuse me, in the church, um, it actually first needs to start in our homes. In order to have a royal culture in the church, it needs to actually start in our homes because if our homes are out of order, come on. If our homes are out of order and all we do is, 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 is come and, and do our church thing and maybe do it with all of our life and all of our might and everything else, but if our homes are out of order, we come to, to walk among royalty, but then we go back to the dungeon. Come on. Father desires our homes to be like a palace. Say that with me. Father, Father desires, desires my home, my home to, be like a palace, to be like a palace. Where our children are called. You don't have to repeat that. Where our children are trained. Where our children are equipped. Where our spouses are called. Where our spouses are trained. Where our spouses are equipped. Where all of our family walk in their God-given destiny. 
Your house doesn't need to be expensive. Your house doesn't need to be beautiful to be royal. It is the kingdom of God manifested in your house that makes it royalty. Not your furniture, not the neighborhood you live in. God inside your house. Your house needs to be a place of cultivation. Somebody say cultivation. A place of prophetic destiny. Because our identity comes from the Lord first, right? It's not by education, but impartation. Does that make sense? But our identity must be communicated by our spouses and our parents onto the children in order for the house to be in order. Because if we have generations of kingdom thinking, how much more likely are we to know him when we grow up? See, if, I, if my great-grandfather was a Christian and taught royalty to my house, and then my grandfather was taught by the great-grandfather, and the grandfather taught my father, and my father teach me, I've got four generations of royalty, of teaching, of exhortation, of exaltation, of, of direction, that I'm going to grow up a prince, ain't I? I'm going to grow up straight. You say, well, you know, Pastor, I'm like the first one in my family. It's got to start somewhere. It's got to start somewhere. Somebody say it's got to start somewhere. <laughs> it's got to start somewhere, doesn't it? Well, I don't know. You know, I, I, I'm the first one and I'm just getting started. It's got to start somewhere. That my children and my children's children and my children's children's children would be blessed. Thank God and hallelujah. But it's got to start somewhere. Let it start with you. Say, I don't have the heritage of, of four generations. I don't either. But it's got to start somewhere. Somebody say it's going to start with me. When our children are raised as a prince or a princess... When our children are raised where their actions are important, where their words are important, where love is important, where they know that they have value, where they know that they're important. And that's where legacy is born. They're empowered suddenly to walk in the kingdom with authority. That is legacy, church. Listen, let, let me be quite honest with you. I was having a talk with, with uh, Pastor Frank and Irma earlier, and I was explaining to them how the church should function. You want to know how the church should function? Me and Irene get up Sunday afternoon. Notice what I said. Sunday afternoon at 1.30, and we don't even worry that church has gone as, as planned without us. Why? Because the legacy that we're setting forth is that our spiritual family, our spiritual children, know that church is what's important and not pastor. That coming to glorify God is more important than coming to listen to pastor. Because one of your associate pastors will get up and preach a word even though they have no notes. Or maybe it turns into a testimony Sunday. Or maybe it turns into a worship Sunday in which worship just goes on and on. Maybe God's Shekinah glory shows up. In other words, I don't have to be here. And it doesn't have to be an, uh, a planned not being here. But I literally can just not show up and know my legacy is to know that Living Word Church will worship the Lord God Almighty whether I be here or not. That's legacy. That you would walk as I've taught you through scripture to walk. That you would pray as I've taught you through scripture to pray. That you would stand as I've taught you to stand through the word. That's legacy. And when we as parents, grandparents, understand legacy, then we understand that we set an example for our children and for our grandchildren, and only through that example, a godly one, a royal priesthood one, 
Only through that church will we ever see our legacy live on. You say, how? How do I raise my family to be empowered? How do I raise my family not to be, uh, to be empowered and not controlled? Because I'm not talking about control. I'm talking about, we talk, what is our slogan? Empowered through God's word, right? See, God told me to raise an army, not raise men unto myself. Raise an army. So the slogan's always been, you know, empowering the believer through God's word. And as we as a church matured, it turned into empowered through God's word. How do you teach your family to be empowered? How is it not about control? <coughs> Number one, you teach them that their opinions are valuable. You know, the funny thing is about my wife. Uh, and she'll, just, she'll say this too. I know it's like, don't worry, I'm not sleeping on the sofa. My wife understands that anything with two heads is unnatural in the, in the natural. It's called a freak. There has to be a head of the house. And I'm the head of the house, and quite honestly, she's, she's told me you're the head of the house. But the interesting thing about head of the house is my wife also knows that even though I'm the head of the house, that she has the right to tell me when she thinks I'm wrong. I've made that very clear. And, you know, the funny thing is, is that when I realize that her opinion is valuable, she's actually changed my mind at times. For those of you who think that I'm too stubborn to change my mind. She's changed my mind. Sometimes I was going on the wrong path just out of whatever it was, whether it was out of anger, whether it was out of resentment, whatever it was, it was out of flesh, okay? And I was going in the wrong direction, but my wife understands that she has the freedom to speak to me, and it's not disrespectful as my, as my wife to give me another opinion because as a husband, I value her opinion. Because if you don't, wives, if you don't give your husband an opinion, then you're creating a spoiled monster. How I many you know if a kid gets what he wants all the time, he becomes spoiled, doesn't he? See, Adam got a helpmate. That's what it says. Not a slave. A part of him. He said, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Adam got a helpmate. How many of you know that in a marriage, it's actually good, and all the women are going to say amen, but it's actually good for the woman to have input. Because if the woman doesn't have input, then all you have is a man's opinion and not a woman's opinion. I knew it was coming. It doesn't make women less than to have a head, okay? It doesn't make that. It, it doesn't happen that, okay? But in everything in nature as well as the kingdom, there has to be a head. There has to be one. Because in nature and in the kingdom, when there's two heads, no bueno. That's why the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, I do what I see my Father doing. He didn't say, well, I'm equal with Dad. I'm part of the Trinity. So I think I'm going to go this way and not do the crucifixion because, you know, it doesn't look like it's a lot of fun. Are you hearing me, church? <coughs> if you want your family to be empowered and not controlled, you teach them that their opinions are valuable. You listen to them. Wow, there's a new one. You make significant decisions with them, especially those that involve family matters. Now, I'm talking about our kids, too. You have discussions with them that are going to affect them. Son, you know what? I'm going to go full-time ministry. Your mom's going to be the one working, so finances are going to go. So you're not going to get everything you want. Or everything you got before. It's part of the decision process. It allows the child to understand. What does it allow the child to understand? You know, uh, quite honestly, it teaches them how to pray when they see you pray. It teaches them how to think. It teaches them how to make decisions for themselves. And it allows them uh, to even, listen, here's a crazy one, guys. 
You should even allow your child to question your decision as long as it's in the right attitude. If it's the wrong attitude, you squash it. You squash it by saying, that's the wrong attitude. Come talk to me when you have the right one. But you allow them to voice, believe it or not, our children are a little smarter than we give them credit for. And they might even bring to light something that we weren't taking into consideration before. Parents, do you want a powerful legacy? I know me as your spiritual father, I want a powerful legacy with living word. I want every single one of you to be empowered through God's word. I want every single one of you to walk as the royalty that you are. To walk in the blessings. And when you walk in the struggles, people don't even know you're struggling. Because you walk as royalty. People don't know what me and my wife go through. They have no idea unless I share it with them. You want to know why? Because I walk as a man convinced that Jesus is still on that throne. No matter what I'm going through. I will laugh with you. I will cry with you. I will hug you. I will, I will talk with you. I'll dance with you. I'll do everything the same way. Whether everything's falling. The sky is falling. Or everything is just perfect. I'm going to be the same way. Because I'm convinced. That my God is still on the throne. That's walking as royalty. There will be storms, church. But how do you walk in the midst of the storm? Because that, that is what you truly look like. I'm reminded spiritually, uh, you ever seen like a, a, a fluffy cat or a real husky dog and they get really wet, especially a cat? What do they look like? Looks like they lost 30 pounds, right? And it's like, shh, all right? And you're like, that's what you really look like underneath all that? That's the way a lot of Christians walk around. And you know what happens, as the Lord told me, is that as the rain falls, the struggle comes, they're exposed. I'm not saying that we don't have bad days. My God, my wife knows my bad days. But I guarantee you, 99% of you don't know my bad days. It's not me being fake. It's me trying to set a standard in this church. And that standard is God the Father is still on the throne. Amen. Sometimes, I, I, quite honestly, I'll hear somebody come up to me and say, Hey, man, you know, uh, you know uh, 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 I've got this really bad bill right now. And I'll be like, Praise God. And you'll look at me funny. Uh, yeah, my car broke down. Praise God. Glory to God. Oh, the doctor says I've only got six months. Glory to God. And you start looking at me like, what's your problem? I said, I will praise him when? In the morning? In the noontime? When the sun goes down? I will praise him what? When things are going well? I will praise him when things are going bad. I will believe that I am healed when the doctor says I'm not. I will believe he will provide when the bank says I have nothing. That is royalty. And when you teach your children, when you walk with your spouse, when you walk in your Christianity this way, then you walk as royalty for all the world to see that no matter what's going on, no matter a thousand fall on this side and ten thousand on the other, I walk the same. Can you say the same? If you want a powerful legacy, you need to give your children time. Did you hear what I said? Give your children time. Somebody say time. <coughs> It's the most expensive and the most precious gift you can give your children. Not an Xbox, not an iPhone, time. Your time. It's the most exquisite gift that you can give your children. More than a tr Christmas tree overflowing with gifts. More than a birthday table overflowing with gifts. And I know all the kids are like, no, 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 you want that too. 
but the most exquisite, the most expensive, the most wonderful thing you can give your children is your time. How many times do I stop a movie or walk away from our time to answer a phone call? Because my children need time. It's expensive. It costs me time with my wife and my son. But it's the most expensive, exquisite gift that I can give you. Sometimes you call and you leave a message. It's like, man, he never answers the call because I'm on the other line. And if you'll notice, when I'm on the line with you, even if the phone rings, I don't answer it. Because it's the most expensive, exquisite gift I can give you as my children. Your time, my time. As a royal priesthood, we're called to develop a culture in our homes. We're called to develop a culture in our churches. We're called to develop a culture in our workplaces. We're called to develop a culture in our businesses. We're called ultimately to develop a culture onto the nations. Because Isaiah 60 says what? That the kings come to us because the glory of God is upon us. The time is coming. Somebody say the time is coming. What is that culture? It's a culture that draws out. It's a culture that brings out the best in everyone. That is a royal culture. A culture that facilitates our kingdom destinies. That is a royal culture. It's here in this life. It's here at this time. It's not just up in heaven. We accomplish a royal culture in this church by actually pulling out the best that is in everyone instead of looking at all the worst parts of people you don't like. Well, I don't like Pastor Jesse. Sometimes he spits when he preaches. Sorry. Sometimes his breath is bad. You talk for 30 minutes or more and find out if your breath ain't good. We accomplish it by seeing, treating others and ourselves not as we are, but as Father has created us to be. See, I choose to see the best in you. I choose to see Father in you. I choose to see the precious gem that you are. That's what I choose to see. Jesus did the same thing. He was hanging between two thieves. One of them he pulled out the best in him. And then he says, truly today you'll be in me. The other one refused the gift. Would Jesus have saved him too if he had said? Of course he would. Would Jesus have saved Judah? I mean, uh, Judas? Of course he would. Empowerment can only come through intimacy with Father. Trust me. Your flesh cannot see the best in people. Did you hear what I said? This empowerment, this ability to look at someone and say, I like that person because I see that emerald, I see that ruby, I see that sapphire, I see that diamond inside of them. That only comes when you've spent time and intimacy with Father. Because your flesh cannot pick out the great things in a person. As a matter of fact, your flesh can't even pick out the great things in you. Because the flesh is wicked. Remember your heart? It's inherently wicked. But when I've spent time in prayer, come on. When I've spent time on my face before God. When I've been studying and reading his holy word. When I've been listening to his voice that speaks to me every day. I can look at you and I can see the preciousness that father sees in you. I, you can slap me in the face at one moment. And I can forget the slap and I can see the pain that caused you to slap me. Because of the intimacy that I have with my God. But if I don't put time 
into having any intimacy if I just live my life and don't put time into prayer or don't put time into just being alone or don't put time into just being quiet and hearing him. If I don't put that time, then quite honestly, you stink as bad as I do. Somebody say, Pastor stinks. It's okay, I don't care. God don't think I do. <coughs> you stink as bad as I do, guys. Why? Because you know what? <laughs> you stink. Sorry. I stink too. But see, that's what we kind of got to understand because we kind of, uh, some of you don't understand how God sees you as righteous and holy and, and just. You don't get it. You don't get it because you're looking at yourself the way your flesh looks at you. You're looking at yourself the way you look at others. God sees you through the spilt blood of Jesus. It says that you are the righteousness of God in Christ. And I'm going to explain that in a minute. And I'm going to explain that in a great way. In your flesh, you cannot see the best in people. But we're no longer slaves to sin. We're friends, right? Somebody say, I'm a friend of God. We sit with him and we walk with him as kings and queens of his court. Hallelujah. In fact, let's pray. Father, grant us insight to see others beyond their outward uh, appearances, beyond their struggles, beyond their walls, that we might seek the treasures that lie within them. May you give us wisdom to develop as kings and priests. May you endow us with power to destroy the works of the devil. In Jesus' name, amen. I pray this right now because I want you to understand something. When you called on the name of Jesus, whatever your birth date is in the spirit, he answered. Somebody say he answered. I'm hoping you're, you're starting to comprehend that you're a royal family. Say, I'm part of the royal family. Royal. Jesus is not only the king of kings because of earthly kings. He's the king of kings because of us who co-rule and reign with him. And I think it's important that father loves. Oh, boy, here we go. I may walk away from the notes. Please pay attention. What we seem to forget is that a king is great when his subjects and his kingdom think that he's great. Does that make sense? Uh, let's let's use uh, let's use our president right now. He's got a real low approval rating. Is our president great? Most of you would say no. Why? Because it's a low approval rating. But if it was a high approval rating, and we said is is the president great? A lot of people would say, yeah, he's great. Because ultimately, a king is great when it's when it's his subjects and his kingdom. Bring him up to greatness. That's what made King Solomon a great king. Not because he said, I am a great king. But because other nations, not only just his nation, but other nations came and said, you are a great king. And they presented him wise and gold and frankincense and silver and gems. And you're a great king. And Solomon became a great king because the kingdom, his kingdom, and all the surrounding kingdoms made him great. Is God a great God? Then in order for him to be a great God, we got to act as though he's a great God. We got to proclaim him as a great God. Walking around in defeat and struggles all the time doesn't make him look great, does it? 
Why, is Pres- why did we say something about President Obama? Oh, he's a great president! Because everybody's looking at the, at the economy. Everybody's looking at the world problems. Everybody's like, and he doesn't, you know, oh yeah, he's a great president, man. We don't say that because why? We, we can't put him in that place. And if we can't put him in that place, he won't be great. He can't be. Because the kingdom decides what king is great. So is God great? Then how you walk determines how great he actually is. I hope you got a hold of that. You know, when you walk around with struggles and you're all down and you can't do this and you can't do that, your God is not great because he's not great unless you make him great. But when you have struggles and you choose to put your face into the wind, to grab a hold of the plow and not look back, you make your God great. Let me bring it home for you. You know when a child graduates or a child accomplishes something at school, how proud we are of them, right? Graduation, they got an award ceremony, whatever it is, okay? Why is the whole family celebrating? Because of what the child accomplished, right? Okay. And, and it brings honor to the whole house, doesn't it? I mean, let's be honest. All of a sudden, the mother that's never there is suddenly the mother of the year. Come on. Come on. All of a sudden, the father that's been absent for the child's entire life wants to show up for graduation. Okay. Because it brings honor to the house when a child accomplishes something. Come on. Okay? (coughs) Now, when you and I, that are sons and daughters of God, receive revelation of our nobility, when we begin to operate in his authority as Father God, the creator of all things, gave us, then just as our children bring honor to the family in their successes, you and I bring honor to Father God. Do you want God to be great at Living Word Church? Do you want God to be great in your home? Do you want God to be great with your wives or your husbands? Do you want God to be great with your children? Do you want God to be great at work or at school? Then make him great. Who wants to bring honor to Father's house? I don't know about you, but I do. In fact, right now before I even finish let's honor him honor him right now how are you going to honor him come on how are you going to honor him how are you going to make him great how are you going to make him great how are you going to make him great you know it's not like you can't make him great by saying glory to God you're number one that's not great. How many of you know it was great to watch the Spurs whoop up on Miami? It was, right? Uh, let's just be honest, okay? You're like, oh, my God, he's putting the Spurs with God. No, I'm not. I'm just asking the question because I know that even yells would come out of me even when I wasn't expecting it. I'm watching it. I'm more relaxed. Jonathan, you know, can't even watch the game sometimes if they're losing. He's just, like, freaking out, Okay. And, and, and Irene, she's, you're pretty good for, for the most part, you know. I'm pretty, you know, reserved. But every once in a while, you know, when you got somebody, you know, somebody gets an, an offensive rebound and just takes it in for a dunk, you know, Kawhi or Tim or whatever, something comes out of me. It's like, yeah! And I'm like, <laughs> right? It just comes out of you, right? How come that doesn't just come out of you when it comes to God? The devil comes in and attacks you? Yes! God's about to do something. God, you know, the doctor says something? Yes! God's going to heal me again, just like he did last time. Why can't we be like that? Because if we make the king great in his kingdom, then it's up to us. Listen, during praise and worship, it's up to you to make the king want to appear. It's up to you. Not the worship team. The worship team leads you saying, hey, this direction, guys, this direction. But you've got to follow the worship team. When they're praising, you better get your praise on. 
When they're worshiping, you start to worship. When they get quiet, you get quiet. Why? Because they're leading. And if you're going to make God great, you got to come together in unity. Father, we honor you. John 15, I don't, you don't have it in the back, Jonathan, don't worry about it. <coughs> John 15, 14 and 15, it says, you are my friends. Somebody say, I'm a friend. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Hello. Most people just part the, like the friend part. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I've called you friends for all things that I have heard of my father. I have made known unto you. That's John 15, 14 and 15. Notice the contrast between master and slave and the contrast between father and friend. Jesus strikes a great balance here. Jesus reminds us that slaves obey out of fear. But friends obey out of love. Do you love them tonight, church? Somebody tell them you love them. Now turn to somebody and say, I love God. You know, a prerequisite to moving out of slavery into friendship is that slaves know, don't know what their master is doing, but friends, friends know all about the master's business. Here's another trick I, I'll tell you. I give you all too many of my tricks. Uh, I do. I preached a long time ago about the difference between a Christian and a disciple. I could easily say a believer and a friend of God. I can tell who is actually a friend of God by the conversation I have with them. Did you know that? By what's on their heart, what's on their mind. Is it their heart and mind or is it God's? I can tell when we talk. I can tell how much time you've spent with God. I can tell. You can tell. You should be able to tell. Because if you're spending time in the presence of the Lord, you'll know the presence of the Lord when it's on somebody else. If you're a son or a daughter of the Most High God, you have been invited. Somebody say, I've been invited. I've been invited. You've been invited to have the same kind of friendship with Father that Jesus had when he was on this earth. You've been invited. How awesome is that? Hallelujah. How awesome is that? That we've been invited to have the same same friendship, same relationship that Jesus had with Father. Not just for signs, miracles, and wonders, but so we could have peace where nobody else had peace. He had to have peace to say, okay, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Amen? Amen. Would you stand to your feet? Find a partner and not your wife. Come on, find a partner, find a partner, find a partner, find a partner. We're going to do some more exercises. <coughs> now, while you guys are finding a partner, let me explain tomorrow. I have a funeral to do, but it should be short and sweet. Um, so I will still be here. Prayer may go a little longer. We'll still have Bible study, okay? So come tomorrow night. If you're on the prophetic team, okay? You need to be here. If you can't be here for the regular service, we're going to start our training tomorrow night at 830. And you've got to be a part of that training if you're going to be part of the prophetic team. Because I am going to make you from knives to razors. I guarantee it. But, but you're going to have to allow me to shave some stuff off. Say shave some stuff off. Shave. You're going to have to allow me to shave some stuff off. Because I will make you a more effective minister. All right? Now, that being said, face your partner. Now, one of you that's looking at each other, say, I'm first. 
Okay, you all got the first part? All right. Look, a bunch of rowdy Spurs fans. Okay, we're going to do two things. Each one of you is going to do these two things. We're going to decree and prophesy to one another, not anything coming from uh, the Lord. We're going to decree over each other. So whoever's first is going to do this. What you're going to do is you're going to decree that you're drawing out the treasure that is within the person, and you're going to decree that you are in agreement with whatever treasure that is. Now, what does that mean? You're calling out in whatever words you want. Johnny, that's perfect, over your son. Same thing, Gloria, over daughter. You're calling out whatever God has put, whatever treasure God has put in them, you are saying, in the name of Jesus, I call you out of that person that all would be able to see the treasure that's within you. And then you're going to say, and in the name of Jesus, I agree with whatever God says about you. Amen? Okay, so you're going to draw it out, and then you're going to agree with whatever gets drawn out. Okay? Ready? Whoever said there first, right now, in the name of Jesus... I release you to minister to your brother or sister. That's all it takes. You're not prophesying over them. You're decreeing. You're, you're speaking life into their, you're, you're polishing their gem. So whoever was receiving, now it's your time to give. Do the same thing back. Don't prophesy. We're not prophesying. All right. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen and hallelujah. Church, if you will learn to look at what is best, not the quirks, not the, you know, I don't like his shirt, I don't like her hat, all that stuff. That's for other churches. That ain't for this church. Amen. Okay? They want to have that, that's fine. All right? If you will learn to look at the precious jewel that your brother or sister is, it will be so much easier to see that jewel in yourself. We're not talking about elevating yourself. I'm talking about elevating others equal to yourself. Then we're able to serve one another. Amen? Amen. See the precious jewel. Nothing else. Nothing else. Somebody shout out hallelujah. Hallelujah. We'll see you tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, for prayer and Bible study. Again.